Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Corpus Cast. As ever, I'm your host, Robbie Love. I'm a linguist at Aston University, and you're listening to the Aston Originals podcast, all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. Welcome. Uh, as you know, in each episode, I interview researchers to find out how corpus linguistics is informing the present and shaping the future of the study of language, with applications in education, health, technology, and many, many others. In today's episode, we'll explore the role that corpus linguistics plays in sociolinguistics and dialectology. Language changes and varies according to uh, all sorts of things, including identity, community, geography, uh, and broader societal changes. Um, and in recent years, with the help of, for instance, social media data, it has become possible to study language variation and change on a scale once thought unimaginable. My guest today is Jack Grieve, Professor of Corpus Linguistics at the University of Birmingham, UK, and a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, Jack's main research interests are in corpus linguistics, sociolinguistics, and dialectology, and he's especially interested in grammatical and lexical variation in English across time, space, and communicative context. Um, and he uh, also develops uh, methods for quantitative linguistic analysis and authorship attribution. Uh, among many other publications, he's the author of the books uh, Regional Variation in Written English, published in 2016, and uh, co-author of the recently published The Language of Fake News uh, earlier in 2023. So without further, further ado, uh, let's welcome Jack Grieve to Corpus Cast. Hello, Jack. Welcome. Hi, Robbie. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's, it's great to, to have the chance to, to have a chat with you here uh, about your research. Um, and I'm going to start with the, the big question that I always ask uh, at the beginning, um, which is what does Corpus Linguistics mean to you? Um, what to me just means something like studying natural language, um, taking samples of natural language and, um, and, and studying language use, studying language structure, uh, language variation change through the analysis of, of real language use and, you know, at some kind of scale to allow for sort of, um, comparative analysis to now allow for, um, um, for, you know, empirical questions to be explored. Um, you know, us usually using computers and stuff, but, you know, I think it's more just really crucially about looking at uh, natural language use. And I think it probably, like, contrasts pretty clearly with other ways of collecting data empirically in linguistics, like, um, like say, experiments or surveys or interviews, which all sort of involve, by definition, you eliciting language data, right? And not just looking at lang lang language data as it exists. So to me, that's kind of the main point about corpus linguistics is really looking at unelicited natural language data and using that as the data for linguistics rather than say um, people's opinions uh, about language or people's intuitions about language or um, or say the way people produce language in a really contrived context, like in an experiment or, or a survey. So tell me when you sort of, first uh learned about corpus linguistics and and more broadly your sort your sort of academic journey was this something that you studied as part of uh an undergraduate degree or was it something that that appeared a little bit later on for you yeah i did my undergraduate i, I started doing my, my, my undergraduate in like math and computer science at a uh, simon fraser university in vancouver um and i didn't do very well i i, I actually i failed my my uh my first intro to computer science that put me on academic probation. And I was, I was retaking the computer science class and I don't know, the lecturer, the professor joked that if you fail computer science, you can always do linguistics. I mean, this is for like 200 students. I'm not sure how many of them had failed or probably none of them, but me went to linguistics. So I went and took a linguistics class, like an intro to linguistics. It was like a night course uh, at the university. And uh, yeah, and then I got into that. Um, did my undergrad at Simon Fraser in linguistics, um, which didn't have any corpus linguistics really that I can recall. Like we did sociolinguistics and like generative grammar and phonology and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I went to do my master's in linguistics after a little break. Um, and, um, that was with, um, 
that was with Paul McFetrich, who's no longer alive, and with Maite uh, Taboada, who is still at uh, SFU, who's quite quite well known. And um, yeah, I started off as a generative syntactician, but um, but I got really interested in like, um, well, actually, I got interested in computer programming. Is what happened. I took a course on programming in Perl, and then you need to work with the corpus, and I really really liked that. I think my first project was like trying to figure out the um you know, like given a text, like what language it was written in. I had like, I built a corpus of like 50 different European languages, dialects and languages that I collected online. And so that's really what got, got me into it. I, I did my master's dissertation was on authorship analysis. So that was corpus based. Um, and then uh, based on that, I decided I wanted to go do um, um, like corpus based dialectology um, because I thought that was kind of an interesting different way of doing authorship analysis. So I went to um, Northern Arizona, did that with Doug Biber. So then obviously at that point you're doing, you're a corpus linguist. Um, and so, yeah, I did my PhD with Doug at Northern Arizona. I think I finished that in 2009. I then went to Leuven uh, to work with Dirk Hure Arts, um, uh, the cognitive linguist um, as a postdoc. Um, but there I was really kind of just doing my own thing. So I worked on like corpus-based dialectology. Um, um, as in, I wasn't doing cognitive linguistics really at that time or ever. And then, and then I got a job at Aston um, as a lecturer there in forensic linguistics, um, and worked with Tim and Chris and people like that. Tim Grant, Chris Credens. Um, and then I don't know about. I think it was 2017. I moved here to Birmingham as a professor, as a professorial fellow first in corpus linguistics, um, and then as a professor in corpus linguistics since I guess 2020 or so. So that's my basic kind of. Um, journey through it. Um, so never, you know, never really working as a, never working in Corpus Linguistics until like as my actual job title until I came, I came to Birmingham. I was a, working in a cognitive linguistics program as a postdoc and then as a forensic linguist, but always doing corpus-based stuff. And obviously mm -hmm. Dirk Arts and Tim Grant do corpus-based stuff as well. So, you know, he's always in corpus, re in corpus research. So you said one of your first uh, uh, experiences of, of working with corpus methods was comparing one text to a corpus comprising lots of different languages and yeah. essentially trying to kind of which one is it the closest to and and yeah. the, the sort of authorship element being you know basically working out what <laughs> who or what this text is compared to a, a bank of lots of texts right yeah yeah so i first the first thing i did i hadn't actually thought about it till 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 i saw i saw the question which was the very first thing i did was just like you know, was this written in French or is this written in German? But also, like, is this written in like Picard or other kind of like pretty narrowly defined languages of Europe? And then that I did that I think for like a Perl programming class, and that was the first time I really worked with Corpora. And then I decided, well, instead of trying to identify languages, let's identify authors, right? And so I started working on that problem. Um, and I at the time I didn't realize that there was a lot of work on it, so I did a bunch of work that was kind of re redundant. But then eventually sort of figured out an angle that was good. But yeah, that's those, those that they're kind of doing comparative, doing comparative analysis of say varieties of the, well, you know, doing comparative analysis of language, of language and, and, and mm. language variation and, and, you know, dialect variation and author variation. That's, that's, that's really where I started and kind of still what I do really. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we're going to get into that now and, and sort of, look at some examples of your your work in computational sociolinguistics we will return to some of the sort of forensic applications a little bit later on sure. uh and and you mentioned uh, uh maite uh, tabuada as well who mm -hmm. we just had on the uh last episode oh, uh, great. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Class as well so that's that's quite nice uh sequence yeah. there that's um good. and uh but we, we let's turn to sociolinguistics to to start with and you know, you've you've done quite a lot of work looking at regional variation in uh, in America, in in the U.S., um, in American English, uh, looking mostly, I think, at quite large Twitter corpora. Um, what I, I guess is what motivates this sort of reason? Is it is it based on? I suppose a, a curiosity from from a methodological perspective. You know, what can we what can we learn? By looking at you know a, a really big corpus of, of Twitter data, um, or is it more about the curiosity of what will we find about you know the linguistic variation, or or is it both? When I first started, 
So it's both Twitter data, but originally, and actually probably more of my publications that are mm. directly on kind of like regional variation and mm. trying to find dialect was on like this big corpus of letters to the editor. I mean, it seemed big yeah. back when I compiled it for my PhD. It was like 25, 30 million words or something like that, which seemed big. It's obviously not big compared to the Twitter data, which is like 8 billion words. But, you know, I think they're similarly motivated, right? And and kind of, um, I think the main thing that the scale, when, as you increase the scale, like when you go from 30 million to 8 billion, what, what you end up doing is two things. You can get more kind of fine-grained regional patterns because you have more data points, like across a map. Um, and then also you can start looking at rare features. And so part of the shift that happened was moving from grammatical analysis of the letter, letter to the editor stuff um, and then moving to more lexical analysis of the bigger Twitter data because, you know, just I guess as most corpus linguists know, like Lexis is these are rare forms often than the grammatical forms. Um, and so you, you know, as you get more data, you can, uh, look at Lexis more. Um, what really motivated it was initially what motivated it was I was doing this authorship analysis work. And I just said to myself, like, it'd be really useful if we could do like, just like we, we can identify who wrote the text and we have a couple of authors. It'd be really useful to be able to figure out the regional background of an author. So that was really the thing that motivated me. And when I first started my PhD, I I don't remember if this was like when I, as I was propo proposing the PhD or, or when I started, but it being pretty quickly apparent, right, that what we really lack is like any knowledge of like there's not there wasn't really supposed to be regional variation in standard written English, for example, or in any kind of written English. So, you know, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a problem if you're trying to automatically identify regional the regional background of an author if there is no regional variation in English. Um, and then the other thing I found was that you know, that most studies of regional variation focused on uh, on Lexis to an extent, um, but these are often very kind of like strange words like farming terms or flora and fauna terms, like things that aren't going to be very useful in a in an actual kind of corpus study or in a applied context, right? Um, or um, it was all based, I mean, most of the more kind of serious work or kind of larger scale, more systematic recent work was based on phonetics and phonology, which is the same across sociolinguistics and I think that's largely because of um, I think that's largely because of of the um, limitations of non corpus data, right? Like you can get a lot of phonetics data pretty quickly. There's not that that many vowels. There, you know what I mean? Like so you can do more systematic studies. And so yeah, so then very quickly it stopped being about the applied problem, which I've never really dealt with. It's like I've never really gotten back into doing proper like identifying of regional backgrounds. It's something we're working on right now. Uh, Dana Romling here is doing this as her PhD. Um, it's work we're doing at this moment, like, you know, 20 years later to some extent, but we never really got back to it. Right. And so it very quickly then became um, more about um, about a showing that regional variation exists in writing or testing if it exists, um, trying to map grammatical variation for the first time across the U.S. Uh, that became a real motivation. Um, and so it became very descriptive in that sense, right? Like really about like trying to like descriptive and also theoretical in the sense of trying to like challenge the limits of of language variation, like that we can find it in standard writing, that it's very patterned in grammar um, in this kind of stuff. And so I think it was, yeah, it was mostly, although it might've been motivated by this applied goal, it became very quickly kind of motivated by, um, by describing language variation, um, by kind of trying to test how, um, like how, how diverse it is. And also, you know, just by somebody who kind of likes maps and stuff. Like I really liked um, the cartography angle of it and learn, learning about spatial analysis and, um, and learn how to make maps. Like that, that was, that was a big motivator too. I've always liked geography, right? So it was sort of an intersection of linguistics and geography, which I like. Yeah. And I, I want to ask you about those, those maps uh, in a minute, but just returning to, to what you were saying there about other approaches to uh, sociolinguistic research, obviously, the the other approaches, a lot of them that, that you mentioned, you know, sort of long predate the use of corpus methods in this context, especially uh, uh, the the data of the the scale that you you've been looking at, especially with the the Twitter stuff, where we're really into the billions and billions of words. Um, what I'm saying, I guess, is that that you know there was already you know uh, an appreciation or a body of knowledge uh, about. Um, uh, regional variation, for instance, to an extent, what has, you know, your approach and, and others who look at large data sets, uh, applying computational methods, 
what has that kind of extended or contributed, you know, beyond what was already assumed to be true in this context? Yeah. So, I mean, like dialectology, you know, is a field that predates modern linguistics, I guess. I mean, I mean, does it just predate like modern linguistics from the 60s, but it predates modern linguistics from the from the early, early 1900s or something, right? So it's, I think it's probably a, a field that's existed before linguistics was called linguistics. And, um, you know, they did huge amounts of data collection there. I mean, it's, it's mm. until corpus linguistics came around, I imagine dialectology was the most data intensive area of linguistics, right? Like just this need to like collect all this data from across a region was really a big job. And in fact, you know, the rise of modern sociolinguistics in the 60s around the same time as generative linguistics. I, I, it's partially like a, was it was a response to generative linguistics. It was also like partially a way of like doing urban sociolinguistics, a way of actually doing this on like a more reasonable way that it take huge amounts of money, right? To study lang 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 language variation, it's much easier to go to New York City and collect data from in New York City than it is to travel around and collect data. Um, and so, yeah, you're right, the scale, but even the scale of the 30 million word, like, um, uh, letter, letter to the editor corpus was huge at the time. Mm -hmm. It quickly got dwarfed, right? Like it very quickly got dwarfed. Um, and I'm glad that yeah, I was part of the group of people who were dwarfing it, right? But but it, you know, at the time that that was huge. It was way bigger than any data set that had been collected. Um, and um, and it was it was really unique in, in terms of the size. Um, but I think maybe what was more important about it and what is you know, what is still true about that work, even as the size has been just, you know, kind of dwarfed, like I said, is that it was really focusing on unelicited language data, like actual language use data. And I don't think there was almost anything in dialectology that did that before that. That's the, those studies I was doing. So the traditional way of doing dialectology, which did collect large amounts of data, uh, was to do surveys, right? So to go around and to interview people um, in person initially, but, you know, in 2006, from data collected in the 90s, um, above and Ash and Bogart published the North America, the Atlas of North American English. That that was all based on um, um, that was all based on um, on um, on phone interviews, right? Mm. And so, you know, aside from the scale, like there is somewhat a limited limitation in scale there. Or at least it's really expensive to do things at large scale, which is part of why there's so little research on American dialectology. Like I think my study was really only like this second full American, the third full American dialect survey after the mm. Atlas of American English and the Dictionary of Regional American English, um, you know, is that you can now do it not just without having the observer's paradox, which is there saying that like, you know, when a, when someone from the North goes into the South and interviews somebody from a different social group, that they might adjust their language to that. Um, but, you know, collecting at scale and at a much more economical way. So we could do it a lot quicker. Um, and then we could also kind of get real language use data so we could move away from um, either click doing interviews where, you know, you hope they use the words that you're interested in, but if you're doing vowels or, or phonetics and phonology, you're pretty confident that in an hour interview, you know, like, like in this interview, I will have uttered probably every vowel in the yeah. English language, yeah. you know what I mean? So you can then look at it, but I probably will, you know, utter obviously a fraction of the grammatical constructions and a fraction of the lexical items. And so you can A, get that data without directly asking for it, um, and then B, you can get it from a lot of people um, much quicker without, you know, I was a, didn't have a team or like big, huge grant to fund it all the data collection. I just did, did it myself, right? And so that's really what I think is the big advantage of those things and how it's different from previous research. And I think it opens up this possibility of looking at um, looking at levels of analysis that we had trouble looking at, grammar in particular. Like you can ask, you can go do a survey and ask lex lexical questions if you know what you're asking for. Um, you can show people a picture and ask them what they call it. Um, it's really hard to ask for grammatical constructions, right? Like these are things that are like, like are hard to um, elicit from people because you can try to ask them directly, but you know, who know, like, you know, people don't know the terminology. Um, you can then try to give them examples, but obviously then you've already kind of elicited, you kind of primed them to give you different answers, stuff like, you know what I mean? So, so yeah. Think, and and it also precludes you from discovering new sort of innovations that you can't, yeah, I mean, you can't do it, right? you don't know what you're asking for right yeah yeah that's 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 i mean i think with the grammatical stuff um it's well with the graphics that's maybe less of a big deal because you still need to go through and kind of like search for like you still need to kind of know what know what you want to look for because you have to find mm -hmm. the features however you know at least you don't have a set 
list of questions. You can go back into the corpus and find things you never thought to have, have looked for. But if you're doing like a survey in particular, you really need to have all these mm -hmm. questions predefined. Um, we do a lot of work on Lexis, especially on the Twitter data. So most of my grammatical stuff was on the letters to the editor. Most of my lexical stuff has been on the Twitter data. And on the Twitter data, you know, it's great because you can look at, like, we've all us up on emerging words. And these are words that we don't know about, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's really hard to ask for these words if you don't know about them. Like an emerging word by definition, like a new lexical item that's taking off. Um, you know, unless it's in dialectology, like, dialectologists don't going to know it, right? Like, they're not going to, they're not, they're not 12 year old kids, right? Like, they don't know these new lexical items. And so, you know, having a corpus means that you don't have to like pre select the features that you're looking at, and it gives you a lot more flexibility and time uh, and possibility to find features you didn't know were interesting. Um, both by, you know, just trying to count things that you discover are interesting as you go, but also by trying to like literally discover the features. In yeah. The that yeah. Really yeah. And you mentioned the uh, the the maps um, that you know I think have sort of captured the the imagination and attention of the the sort of broader uh, you know public uh, discourse and and journalists have have you know repeatedly over the last several years reported on your your dialect maps. I, I believe um, I've been receiving messages from uh, our producer Sam. I believe that we might have one one or two of these maps that may appear at some point on the screen. Yeah, um, they're all mine. They're all mine. Yeah, like that's mine. There so you they're, go. They're fairly attributed to me, but the garish color scheme and that GI Z score gives it away. Um, this yeah, is yeah, definitely this is definitely you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely me. Definitely so, me. So, I guess with this as a, as an example, um, you, what what are we what what are we seeing here and 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 how because you know if with the Twitter data, I I, I guess it's not every single well first of all how, you know how do you identify who is american or who is you know using american english but but then also in terms of the geographical aspect i i i imagine it's users who are sort of self-defining as i am in this place I, i'm located yeah, here no, while this I'm really located so these are people yeah. whose smartphones back in the day were recording where they were whenever they tweeted um, that's the only criteria we use. There's no other filtering here. So we don't try to figure out where someone's really from. Um, we personally, I see this as just kind of being the like kind of default model for kind of doing a synchronic dialect study, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you'd kind of just want people where, where, where they are. So it's kind of like if you sat on a, inside one of these counties, these are all subdivided by counties. You can kind of see it in kind of the, you can kind of see the, especially in the West there, you can kind of see where. Uh, the borders are of the different summaries. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea is just that this is just what you would, you know, what you would see if you ran through tweets that originated from this region. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the stuff about, I mean, I think this is a good example that, or a good topic is sort of like this idea that like dialect, dialect studies need to focus on people who have lived in a spot their whole life. I mean, that was really just initially proposed as a way to handle the fact that you're only collecting a couple of people at each location. And mm. so you better be sure that, that you got people who do something local um, or else you wouldn't find anything. And then also, you know, initially the mo motivation was explicitly that they were interested in preserving old dialects before they disappeared. And so they wanted people who represented the language as spoken, you know, years and years before. Uh, we don't have any of those interests and we have tons of data at each location. Um, so we do proper synchronic dialectology here, meaning this is just a snapshot of language at, in this one, in this case, this, this one year period. And, um, you know, and it's very robust patterns. In fact, they're more robust than what, than what you get back by looking at two very carefully selected people, right? Um, yeah. It's to having a lot of people, you know, there's thousands of people in each one of these. So basically what this is, or sometimes hundreds of thousands, what what what, what this is, is um, there's about 3,000 counties in the U.S. Uh, for every tweet in the corpus, I think there's about a billion tweets in this corpus. This is from 2013 to 2014. Um so for every tweet in the corpus, it's just sorted based on a long lat into what county it was produced in. Um, it's not sorted by individuals, so someone could be in multiple. One one person could be in multiple counties, not yeah. not, not not one tweet. Um, yeah. And then you basically just stratify the corpus based on the counties. So this in this corpus, there's around three thousand subcorpora. Each one corresponds to one of these U.S. counties. Um, and then each one we can measure the relative frequency. In this case, of the word dang in that county, right? So we can say, you know, in a county in the south, it happens at a higher relative frequency than in a county in the north, right? Basically mm. what you see there. 
And then we plot those results. This is a smooth map. There's also raw maps available that show kind of the same basic pattern, but it's not quite as clear. So this has been sort of um, um, analyzed and uh, converted to a map that lets you sort of see the underlying regional signal in the data. But like for this one, it's quite strong. You see it clearly in the uh, in the raw data too. And so that's basically basically all it is. It's just um, just a bunch of these little corpora. Each one of them is a county, and we can measure the relative frequency of these words. I guess maybe one thing to say quickly is that, you know, this is very different than traditional dialectology, right? So traditional dialectology does not look at the relative frequency of anything, right? Like they're not looking at the relative frequency of like how often something is produced in the way we usually do in corpus linguistics, right? Like we there's lots of research in corpus linguistics where we look at you know how what's the rate of usage of of nouns or determiners or the word the or a or or, or in this case a lexical item, right? Um, that's not what they do in sociolinguistics. They would look at say dang versus damn. I guess might be the most mm. often. They look at these alternations, and the idea there is that you're controlling for variation in meaning, and you're just uh, in referential meaning. You just want to look at the variation in social meaning. So you take two words. You know these are common in British dialectology too, right? Like bap and bun and. Oh, um, yes. Oh, my goodness. So you take a set of words that has the same basic meaning, and then you plot where one is more or less frequent compared to the others, which makes a lot of sense, right? Like it shows you how this lexical choice works. Um, but, you know, these results are somewhat surprising because I didn't do that. And yet mm -hmm. they show really clear regional patterns. And I think it's an important point because, you know, it, it violates a lot of the kind of basic ideas of... Um, of um of doing this kind of work of doing dialectology dang is a pretty good one and that you could do another way dang versus damn it's literally kind of like a but you know other ones aren't so clear right like what do you do with most swear words yeah like like that one like like there's no real word that just contrasts with it yeah you know, yeah so for, for the benefit of those who are listening i should add uh who aren't watching us on on youtube we're, 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 we've just been having a look at the 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 map of dang and and now uh, the map of uh, the the F word uh, is is here, which basically shows um, around the, the 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 borders. I guess <laughs> uh, the the uh, on the the east and west coast, you've got an awful lot going on, and also sort of South Texas and Florida, etc. Um, so you see, kind of in, on this map, what 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 you see is that the that the F word is used relatively infrequently infrequently in the center of the country. Yeah. and used much more frequently around the edges of the country, um, which can be fairly easily interpreted. I mean, most of the places where it's really common are places that are fairly urban um, or places that have large, um, I think you could say large African-American, excuse me, African-American or Hispanic populations uh, and urban populations. And in kind of the heartland, you see that it's much uh, less common. Um, if I recall, there's a there's an article we did for QuartzQZ.com out there, and it shows what we did was we took these maps, we took all like 10,000 top word maps in the United States. Uh, we then correlated them all against the uh, 2016 election results between Clinton and, um, and and Trump, and we showed that this word was the best predictor of a of a Clinton vote. So <laughs> out of 10,000 words, the the word map that matched the Clinton vote map the best was this one, as in places where the F word is used tend to commonly on Twitter, tended to vote for yeah. Hillary Clinton more than any other word. Um, and the word that best predicted Trump is almost the exact opposite of this, obviously. So more used in the heartland and not mm. used elsewhere. And that word was crap. Oh, OK. OK. And so you almost okay. see like an alternation right there, right, between these. Super, yeah. Super, I mean, with, yeah. Yeah. With, I mean, with the F word, there's there's a there's, a, you know, a, a fairly strong kind of well, as with a lot of swear words, you know, the age um, sort of effect. And so it doesn't surprise me in a way that that if you have i i don't know this but i'm assuming that on average an, an awful lot more you, relatively younger people voted clinton than they did trump and the yeah that, that's, you know, that's right, I guess. known kind of correlations of these various groups right yeah i think it's also though i mean but it's also just i mean it's more this kind of i think it's i mean it maps on nicely to kind of the urban rural divide mm -hmm. that's i think more what's happening here in the sense that yeah. I think you're right. I don't really know how age maps onto the rural urban divide in the U.S. I assume not this clearly, right? So right. Yeah. We're probably yeah. there is age variation in the U.S. Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, places like Florida or older. Yeah, there it is. So this is Sam is Sam is going wild now. We're 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 oh yes, this is the, we're just uh, 
just just telling us about yeah is that right yeah so there's crap at the very top that's the most trump word and i think the f word is at the very bottom of that like diagram those are all the words in the corpus and oh, i see correlate. i see and, and then, there, yeah there it is yeah there it is and there's ipa right above it ipa dope brunch honey cocktails uh-huh yeah yeah so those are very like urban words really mm, yeah you absolutely know? absolutely and then on the other end is all these like I think truck and road and farm and stuff right at the other end. These yeah. are, I mean I think a lot of these words aren't surprising at all. They're exactly what you'd expect by the urban rural divide. But I think the the the, the peak words on either side are are mm -hmm. very unexpected, um, very uh, related to each other in an interesting way, and um, and and maybe pretty informative about the differences in yeah populations who vote for different parties in the U.S. Yeah. What do you um what do you think it is that that sort of fuels this kind of curiosity? You know, th this sort of research, you, you know, your own and and other studies that that look at, you know, whether social variation or some some sort of kind of broader sort of scale look at which words are more or less popular things like that. What is the sort of, you know, it it does get covered quite quite a lot. It's it's mm. usually something that ends up in in the press what why do you think it is what is it that motivates this perhaps inherent curiosity and an interest that people have in in learning more about these trends uh in society yeah i mean i think part of it is that it's like visualized as well right yeah like, like including there on the maps but also on those other plots you showed um yeah. so i think the visualization is a big part of it i think part of the reason why these maps got picked up by lots of people is because it look they look fairly nice you know yeah um i said the garish color scheme before but i mean that might not have been totally um counterproductive on that end mm -hmm. um so i think that's part of it right people like and i think you know increasingly what you find is there's just all these like online you know so-called news organizations that need to fill up the page and they really want to fill the page up with pictures too right mm -hmm. like they really want you to click on it so i think part of it's just that like it's nothing more than that i i think that's maybe why in my mind, the regional stuff, maybe I don't have that. I don't look at that much other social variation, but I think the regional stuff tends to do better than anything else, right? Uh, language yeah. change, they like too, right? Because that can be graphed nicely as well. Um, I think the other thing is that it's, you know, is that it's somehow it's fairly like, it's both kind of related to, you know, kind of people's biases and stuff. Like they like kind of seeing how they're different or seeing how other people are different from them. They like the regional stuff. Like it shows these differences that maybe they don't know about, but that they kind of believe in anyway. So it kind of a really nice way of showing people how people differ. Um, you know, I think there's probably some, um, you know, maybe some not totally positive parts why people like it, right? Because it kind of lets you think yeah. about how people are different than you. Um, but I also think it's just that, you know, that this is stuff that 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 people kind of know about. Like they have a kind of a, a feeling about dialect. Yeah. Uh, and it's easy enough to talk about too. Like, I mean, I think if we're talking about other types of linguistics, why it's not as popular, like it's, it's all pretty easy to understand, right? Like you show people a map, they're used to seeing maps, you know, they know people who live in these different spots, they can visualize it. And then you're telling them words that they know, right? Cause we're usually mm. using, you know, everyone knows these words. We're not talking about like, you know, anaphor or something like that, right? That nobody knows what you're talking about. So I think it's all those things, but yeah, I think it's probably people have some intuitions about it. It's sort of, you know, the other thing is, right, is if you were to show like, so I don't know, like variation in cross sex or gender or cross race, like these all, these bring up things that are more potentially problematic, right? That people mm -hmm. maybe are a bit more sensitive about. But when you talk about regional variation, I don't know. I think most people just find it interesting and don't really think too much about it in, in more of a kind of like a problematic way. Um, and I think maybe rightfully so, right? Because we're all just where we're born and, you know, you just sort of pick yeah. up and there's nothing wrong with it. Now, obviously, you know, in, in recent months, there have been a lot of changes with Twitter, specifically Elon Musk taking over. And and only, I think, a few weeks ago, there were some um, potentially quite quite challenging uh, changes that were made with regard to access mm -hmm. of academic researchers to Twitter data. So, you know, the obvious question, I guess, is is what happens now? Presumably, researchers in who, who have been relying on on large scale sort of Twitter data, they can continue to use the data they already have, I assume. Um, but moving forward, you know, what 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 do you think will be the sort of longer term 
impact? Where, where will researchers turn to to kind of continue to access that kind of real time usage data, if not Twitter? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the thing about Twitter is it has lots of users, right? So it's not just a fact that it's like online, but it's a, it's very popular, right? And traditionally, they made the data available for free, so that helped. That's obviously those are both necessary things, right? But just having a platform that makes the data available for free is it sufficient if nobody's using it? Um, I think there's lots of things here. So I mean, the one thing is is that like yeah. So I think people have to move on to other other sources of data is what's going to happen. I mean, yeah. uh, Musk has been complaining about large scale scraping of data off the site, and that's something you can do not not using the API, but using like third party tools, which are arguably essentially uh, violating the terms and conditions of Twitter, but you, you can do this if you want. Um, I don't think there's anything really, I don't think there's any real, well, I don't know, I, I will get legal advice here. Um, so <laughs> you, you can do that if you want, um, but like that's becoming harder. They're probably increasingly like, likely to crack down on it. I think the bigger thing that's happening here, right, is that is that all these companies, so Reddit's doing something similar right now. Reddit was even more generous than Twitter. Uh, Twitter's always oh, right. had Twitter's always had the requirement that you can't actually share your data with other people directly. You have to give them the mm -hmm. codes. They can do what's called rehydrating. We can go download them again, but it's a very slow process. So a big corpus like mine, you really, you know, take you years to rehydrate it. Um, um, but I think what's really happening here is that like all these companies are starting to realize like how valuable their data is as all these large language models are trained off of these data sets, right? And so mm -hmm. what they're seeing, I mean, I think this is exactly what's happening with Reddit because in Reddit, they're using the Reddit data in really creative ways, right? So you have like, on Reddit, you have things that are like, um, like too long, don't read summary things. So they'll give you a website and then people will summarize it for you. It's just training data for automated summarization, right? Like it's perfect, right? There's lots of this kind of unique ways of using, using social media data. And I think what's happened is these social media companies have realized that, you know, they're essentially doing data collection for free for these big large language model AI companies, and they've not been profiting off of them. And especially when you see that these Lots of these social media companies have trouble, have a trouble, hard time turning profits. Then this becomes really like an obvious leakage in the, in the whole business model, and one that they weren't totally expecting. Um, you know, we're working off these really large multi-billion work corporate for dialectology, but then nobody really cares because you know it's not the most like applicable thing in the world, right? I mean, there are applications, but it's not you know OpenAI level applications, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what's happened here. I, from my perspective, I haven't used any Twitter data. Um, I've been using any new Twitter data since um, since 2015 because the geolocations been was dropped in 2015 2016. It wasn't dropped; it just went from mm. opt out to opt in. So back in the day, if you were tweeting on your phone in 2014 when we were collecting data, unless you were, um, and I should say this was collected by Diang Chen Guo at University of Southern Carolina, not 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 by me directly. I did the analysis mm. of the collection, but back then, if you were collecting data, like. Anything that came off a mobile phone would be like 95% of the time would have a geocode to it, a geolocation, like telling you the precise long and lap where you could like zoom into like, yeah. you know, you could zoom into the room somebody was in. Like, yeah, I remember. Like, I used to tweet with that feature on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, everyone tweeted with that feature on unless you turn it off, right? If you're on a mm -hmm. smartphone tweeting in 2014, unless you went into the settings and like explicitly turned it on, that was that information was being recorded. And unless you were a private user, that you, information was available to anyone with, with the API. Um, and so that changed in around 2015. And I think it went from like, you know, 95%. About the, I mean, I'm making these numbers up, but they're not too far off from reality. Mm -hmm. um, I think David Jurgens has a nice has, has a nice graph and a paper of his. Um, um, but anyway, they dropped from about 95% geolocated to like 5% geolocated. And so it really dropped that, that. So we haven't actually worked with data since new data since mm -hmm. 2015, 2016. You can still have these, like kind of what you implied earlier on, which was that these are based on kind of like self-declared locations, and that's still there, right? Like my self-declared location says Birmingham, I think, but I'm really referencing. I don't live in Birmingham actually. I live I'm just referencing where where my work is. Yeah. And often those things are varied. Like some people will say England, some people will say United Kingdom, some people will say Earth, some people will say Mars. You know what I mean? Like it's it's totally unclear how reliable those are, and the resolution just varies wildly. And so we've certainly found, and you can see in other people's work that when you start working with self-declared locations instead of true geolocations even though those geolocations are on the tweet level and can vary like one like like one person can now produce tweets in all sorts of different places but despite that these regional patterns are way way stronger when you work with actual geolocated data 
And so from that perspective, I mean, the Twitter data has been from, for dialectologists has been useless for, or nowhere near as good as the old data, mm -hmm. for, um, you know, for a decade. Um, I don't know though, Robbie, if like, if what you're saying is, is actually true. Like, I think there's going to be some problems with using this old Twitter data. And I don't know. We'll see what happens. Oh. I just, so you, you think it, you think it might it it might end up being you know sort of prohibited that you well I think Twitter's going to try to make it prohibited yeah I think Twitter's going to make it try to make it prohibited I think they're probably already trying um, they've always put these kind of restraints on like you're supposed to delete any tweet from your corpus that has been deleted from the system which when you hold a billion tweets is not feasible um, <laughs> no at all um, no. I think it I don't think that. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, it seems to me that like, it seems to me that like corpus linguists are probably who are work, 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 work with Twitter data are probably bolstered to some extent by AI companies fighting against this. So if AI companies can hold the data, then so can we presumably. Um, and so we'll see. Um, I think it probably comes down more to the publishers, right? So when you try to publish this research, how much do they care? Uh, and yeah. so well, we have a paper right now in review at plus one on double modals. Um, and we'll see, we're starting to, I'm, I'm, we're getting these kind of like requests in the reviews to kind of address, um, the accessibility of the data. And I'm wondering if we're heading down a road where they're going to say, are you sure you have, you know, current Twitter's permission to use this data? We'll see, we'll see what happens. I don't quite know, um, but I suspect that like, say linguistics journals won't be necessarily too quick to care, but yeah, mm -hmm. this like, I, I wonder, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going to happen with it. We'll see. I, well, I don't yeah, we'll, sure we'll work, work, work with it so much anymore. So I'm not so worried, but we do have a bunch of papers in review right now on using Twitter data for both American and British dialectology. And, um, and we'll see, I think, I think these will be okay, but it might get harder and harder moving forward. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see what, what, what happens there because, you know, I guess in my, in my mind, the, the, the fear is I'm thinking about all these, you know, maybe postgraduate researchers, PhD candidates who started a PhD project a year ago, you know, sort of preparing to gather loads of Twitter data. And then suddenly all of this has happened in the last year. And yep. oh, yeah, Reddit, what, Reddit, what do I do now? You know, and uh, I think Reddit data has really taken off in the last five years as, as a solution to certain limitations with Twitter data, including sharing your data, but they're in the midst of doing it. I think that was part of what the big Reddit strike was about. I mean, that, that, that was more about, I think these bots that have, lots of usages for the moderators where they don't have to do things that they're now sort of expected to do, um, do by hand. Um, mm. I, I suspect those bots are even more closely related to, I don't know much about the topic, but I would, I assume they're even, they're also re related to the automatic downloading of Reddit data, which was very easy to do back in the day. It was nothing to it. In fact, you know, there was like a whole torrent you could just download that had the entire Reddit up to that data and it was being dated and being updated all the time. Um, and so the Reddit data was a huge thing. And like I said, it's a bit more diverse than the Twitter data. Like it gives you a yeah. lot of, I mean, it's not as good for regional stuff, but for other things, it's really good because you can go now and look at like, I don't know, let's look at this social group, this social group. And these are very finely divine, defined forums that are on particular things that you can really go get really like, you know, you want, you know, you want data from some community that's marginalized, then that's there, mm -hmm. right? It's what's on Twitter, it's what's, what's on Reddit and it's sorted for you by default and easy to access. So that's also going away. Um, I think probably longer term, the solution is just that we'll just find other data sources, right? I mean, you know, these data sources will just keep coming. Yeah. Uh, like another problem, Robbie, is just that like, you know, it's kind of a big one just in general. And that's like, increasingly we're going to have all this online data, like polluted, if you like, I mean, depending on your interest with just like automatically generated text, right? Like that's going to be everywhere. Um, and it's going to make this data harder and harder to draw direct conclusions about human language off of because a lot of it's going to be uh, automated through large language models and that's going to start filling up a lot of these data sets we're working with i mean there's general worry in large language model training about about this problem that becomes sort of mm -hmm. cyclical and you just start training on your own output um and that will be a problem yeah. for large-scale corpus linguistics for sure yeah no you you're right that that's potentially a, a real challenge and kind of leads me to question or, or maybe will will lead to 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 researchers questioning you know what what is authentic language <laughs> right uh, is it yeah yeah no it puts a whole it, it on. About who, who produces it or is it about how it's used 
I mean, right. traditionally, a corpus linguist, if you're working with pre-existing data, like the one thing you know is that it's authentic data use in authentic human data language use. It wasn't mm-hmm. produced under, under you know, ex, you know, experimental or another kind of data collection kind of constraints where the mm-hmm. observed paradox is a big deal. And now, yeah. now you have this new wrinkle there, which is that, you know, if you really want to look at human language directly, not kind of one step removed, because of course these large, large language models are all trained on human data, but, um, but yeah, yeah, increasingly that's going to be less and less true. Yeah, you know, if some company uses an AI tool to help them write some corporate statement on something, um, and they put it out there, and that is the statement they publish, then then it's authentic in the sense that we're yeah, yeah, yeah. how people use language. But is it? It's not authentic in the sense that it was originally written by a human, right? So right, and yeah. it's but you know, it's it's real language. It's out there, and it's being just being it's being it's in the language use cycle. I mean, it's there. People are, are are taking it in, and they're maybe not taking it in knowing it's a machine or not, and maybe it doesn't really matter in some sense. Yeah. Right? It doesn't really matter. But, you know, you can start seeing how this kind of stuff has, you know, how it can start, like, driving lang- language change and stuff in really weird ways, right? Like, yeah. you know, if we're all learning, if we're all learning how to write business reports by reading business reports that were written by machines, then all of a sudden what machines are doing starts to drive how language might change in that context. Mm. Now, as we start to wrap up, there is one more thing I, I, I sort of want to want to touch upon, um, which is related to your your interests that we've been discussing, which is the diachronic element. You know, looking at how is this sort of uh, you know variation changing over time, and and what are, what are the changes? And um, you know, one approach that that is becoming, I guess, more common. I mean, my my experience is with spoken data. I think you know. With written data, this has been going on a lot longer, but with spoken data, it's not been so easy to get diachronically comparable data sets, right? That's that's it's it's a real challenge. And you know, we're starting to see examples of that happen. There's the new BNC project with the the spoken and the written stuff. There's uh, you know, new members of the brown sampling frame kind of being added. Sort yeah. of every fifteen years or so, um, there's there's you know examples, uh, other examples as well, um, and I think that you know from my perspective, the the motivation to do the sort of stuff that I and others do with the BNC data is compare the first one to the second one and go, oh, what's different, what's the same, etc., and go what this might be, you know, related to stuff that's changed recently is mainly because there there isn't really you know so much more. Uh, comparable data from longer periods or more sampling points, and so, yeah, I guess I'm sort of interested in your your perspectives on this. I know it's something that you've you know you've you've talked about um, before, and so the this kind of perspective on on I guess the validity in a way of of doing this kind of comparing two points in time, and you know you can't guarantee you can't say this has definitely changed, obviously, but. but but is, is there a is there a contribution really to the the language change discussion as opposed to other sorts of discussions that are you know maybe not so contentious just to run broadly about describing how language is used in these contexts? Yeah, so I think so I think in general, like comparative corpus linguistics, when you're comparing across two corpora that were collected differently and not at the same time, like not not sorry not at the same time, but like in the same you know, in the same attempt to collect data. So I think if you have like a stratified corpus where you collect a bunch of data, then you can stratify it and you can stratify it along various ways. Like say, you know, you can stratify by gender, you can stratify by register, you can stratify like we do by county. Um, and we also do a lot of work in the, on, on that Twitter corpus in a one year period where we stratify by day and we track changes over the course of a year, right? And mm. there what you have is a whole bunch of these time points. But uh, let, let me get back to the time point question. But I just, more broadly, like when you're making these comparisons, like, I think a it's really hard to make the comparisons when the data was collected differently. So like the ICLE corpora making world English comparisons, um, comparing the different Browns or the different lobs and these kind of things, like they're just they were collected under really similar conditions. And so there's all these like confounding variables there that are always kind of there in observational corpus research. Like you don't really know like if you take like American tweets and British tweets and compare them, you find some difference. Like you don't know if that's really from American or British. It might be that the American had like. I don't know, like 
much higher on average education level than the British. It might be much older than the British people. It might be much different gender split or different economics, right? You just don't know. These are uncontrolled factors that are there. And so at best you can say like, well, we found this difference. Now we need to figure out why that difference exists. And so I think it's really hard to do that and to be very confident that those differences are even existing if you were to like kind of sample out equally from these populations um, unless they were kind of sampled together. Um, and so... You know, so like the old BNC, the new BNC, I don't know. They're not totally comparable, really. Uh, you don't, there's not, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, like there's even less faith than normal. Like even like, if you look at like one of my Twitter corporate, there's like not really any faith that the people from Arizona are comparable to the people from California, except from their regional background. That probably isn't true at all, right? Because there's other mm, demographic mm. differences across the US. It's not like if you map gender, age, economics, voting, that those things are all just kind of, you know, totally consistent across the US. So you know, it's hard, but when you're doing it with stuff that's even more like disconnected, then the number of confounds is increasing and increasing. We should be less and less confident that um, mm. that that there's a difference. Now, for lots of linguistic, extra linguistic factors, there might be legitimately just two data points, really. So if we want to compare British and American English, there's British and American English. Like we can obviously yes. subdivide those into smaller ones, but it's reasonable enough to ask, like, is there a difference between British English and American English in general? We know there's lots of differences, right? Like we know from experience that you know, mine and your accent sound different because I have a North American accent and you have a British one. Um, so when there's two data points, then, okay, so you have this, always have this problem with corpus linguistics. Like, is it really comparable data? And like, how far can we, what can we really assume is the cause of the difference? It's not necessarily, in fact, it's usually not the thing that we're looking at. Like the difference between British and American English isn't from nationality, right? Like, mm. uh, like, like my son has, American nationality, but he's born and raised here in Britain. So it's not nationality, right? So is it like, well, how much time you lived there? Well, I guess, but then my son like, you know, grows up with me and my wife who speak North American English. So he's not quite a very good representative of British English then either, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're obviously when we say British American English, like we're talking about a whole confluence of different things around history and education and culture and, you know, all sorts of things that matter here, right? Um, yeah. Now, when you do time, it's it's I think it's even harder. And I think the reason it's harder with time is that like, you know, time is not something that's just a binary category, really. Like you might ask, like, how is English different from the 1990s to the 2000s? And then you get these two. That's fine. That's that. But you couldn't then, by seeing that there was a difference between the 1990s and 2000, then extrapolate from that, like long term language change. You couldn't you couldn't from that point. You don't know if things were even, say, lower in the 1980s and even lower in the 1970s. They're going to be even higher in the 2010s and 30s. Like, you need some kind of trajectory to establish that mm, because mm. time variation, there's all these like cyclical patterns, right? Like, um, I don't know if I measure, uh, the temperature in, um, in December and then in July, right? Like I'll see a rise, yeah. but I wouldn't want to then assume that it's rising. I mean, I might not right now it's so cold, but you know what I mean? Right? Like you wouldn't want to assume then that the temperature is just rising endlessly. I mean, this almost, mm -hmm. might, this almost might be true in today's society, right? Global warming and something, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's a cyclical yeah. pattern, right? you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's dark out, it's light out at 6 a.m. and it's dark out at 10 p.m. Therefore, it's just going to get darker and darker for the rest of our existence. And so I think that's the real reason why you need these multiple points on time. I think yeah. it's really the same, like there's a difference between, so notwithstanding the issues around how comparable are these corpora anyway that we're comparing. Yeah. But I think we could say like, look, given these two corpora, we can observe that there's a difference between, you know, this time period and this time period. But whether or not it's a change seems to me... Mm question that we need some kind of trajectory with at least two or three points I mean, at least more than three points the other thing here of course is that with two points you'll always see a chain like you'll always see a difference right yes two yes points, they'd never be exactly the same and how yeah. different they have to be to be a difference isn't an easy question so if you have four points and you see they're all rising then that's a lot better evidence of rise than two points that show a difference yes. like two points would have always showed a difference right yes yeah of course yeah i think I think yeah, from from what you're saying, it's 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 I guess a distinction. Yes, the procedure is part of it in terms of you know from a from a practical perspective, the design of the corporate, which is an issue with any type of comparison, whether it's synchronic or diachronic. Um, but aside from that, it sounds like it's more to do with what you, how you interpret what you observe, right? In terms yeah, exactly. of yeah, there's yeah, a difference yeah. here. What you generalize. Yes. Yeah. And and you know this. A distinction between saying okay it's different from this corpus in the 90s and more recently mm -hmm. another thing would be to say in another 20 years it's going to be even lower or higher or whatever right so sort of trying to predict a trend or, or i guess even predict backwards a trend although that's not 
as difficult in in that at least you can maybe look at what research in similar context it might not be exactly the same context but you might know you know throughout the 20th century there's been a general decline observed in x you know i'm not looking at exactly the same thing but is it similarish yeah 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 i think that's all we can ever do right is like you know corpus we're never in a proper corpus study where we're working with unelicited data i mean there's always these confounding factors that we've never controlled for right uh, we don't have like experimental control. We can't at the end of the day, be like, well, this definitely caused this. And in fact, like I say, we generally assume it doesn't like we don't really think that nationality or gender causes language variation. We think that it's correlated with language variation, but nobody thinks that like, you know, like you could do an experiment on this. You could literally have like get the British government in here. We could get some American tweeting and then we could like get the British government, <laughs> make them British and then have them tweet again. And we, we, they wouldn't change their language. Right. Yeah. So nationality is yeah. not like a cause. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Of course, in physics, we don't do that. We like try to find patterns, and then we try to explain those differences, but not not from the experiment itself. We didn't do an experiment, right? So then we say, okay, well, what's different between British and American English, and we or the history of British and American? And we start looking at that, right? And we say, okay, well, you know, this happened because I don't know people moved here and they took the British forms and they left them here and then they changed to Britain, but they're you know fossilized in parts of the U.S. or something like that. Like these are explanations, but they're not just like nationality explanations. But that's that's the that that's the pattern we observe and that we try to explain, and then we hope that by explaining it, we get to better understanding but we never really know that for sure in a way although the other end is that we know the difference is real like we do know that there are differences yes. in american english like they're not just something that we can isolate in an experiment but have no reality in the real world um so that's the trade-off and mm. you know, i think it's probably smart for corpus linguists to appreciate that trade-off and to like not refer to our studies as experiments not to treat our results as causative and to be <laughs> But on the other hand, to be more confident in the in the external validity of our results, that these are real things that happen in the real world, um, that they matter, that there's a difference we can observe in the corpus. So I think that's that trade-off that um, I think a lot of us in corpus linguistics especially have been kind of, well, I think a lot of ling ling linguists have been pushed towards this idea of like kind of linguistics as an experimental science that's really yeah. neat and tidy and can be divorced from the social world and that we can just like do this in labs and figure things out and and at least when we're talking about how language is used in the social world, which is what corpus linguists and sociolinguists and discourse analysts do, um, then that kind of paradigm is not right. And trying to force or pretend that we're in that paradigm is only to our detriment and, and doesn't really move, move things forward. Well, on that note, we're going to bring things to a close with our final three quick questions, um, which... Uh, we are. Uh, we I recently changed them. Actually, these are these are a, a fresh batch that are okay. uh, just been rolled out recently. So, uh, first one, if you're ready, is yeah. is research in corpus linguistics living up to its potential? Yeah, I mean, I think broadly, it's the most, it's the most, it's the biggest methodological advance in corpus linguistics over the last like forty years or something like that. It's just it's omnipresent across all areas of linguistics now and it didn't used to be i was at a i was at a chomsky day in reading about six seven years ago it was a general linguistics day and halfway through the conference someone said can we finally start looking at usage data now are we ready to do this using corpora and half the room stood up and clapped and the other half sat down and didn't clap but even there right like even in the spot that was most critical of corpus linguistics it's really common it's increasingly common in sociolinguistics now like the computational sociolinguistics is essentially a movement towards using using corpora in that field it's common in all areas, really. I think it's the most, it's by far and away, clearly the most successful um, um, method, met, methodology, at least in linguistics over the last 50 years. I don't know if, I don't know how much corpus linguistics, the field that we're in is responsible for that, actually. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean we're certainly very influential in things like, um, in certain areas, applied linguistics, discourse analysis, register analysis, um, in areas of obviously around lexicography, English grammar, uh, collocation stuff like that but we don't actually can't take a lot of responsibility for the growth of corpora in psycholinguistics um uh in sociolinguistics really in other areas these are things that just happen because they were good ideas and obvious and once the data comes online online nobody really doubts it except a few people who for theoretical reasons don't like the idea of looking at usage data at all but for most areas of linguistics it's it's sort of what anyone coming in would think you would do right like look at corpora it's kind of if a physicist or a undergraduate mm -hmm. is just smart comes in then corpora, corpora cor doing corpus linguistics makes a lot of sense for most research questions 
And speaking of people who are coming in, uh, the second quick question is, what is your number one brief piece of advice for new students who are embarking in corpus linguistics? Yeah, I'll give two, okay? So one would be to learn how to like program, mm -hmm. to learn how to like process these corpora, because as they get bigger and bigger, and as more and more data comes online that you might want to get and build corpora out of, like it becomes hard and hard to do this by hand, right? So one thing is to learn how to, and that's even true for spoken data. You can see how soon we'll be auto transcribing things like that's already happening. So I think that's the one. And the other one would just be to like, you know, probably not like think of yourself first and foremost as a corpus linguist, but to figure out what area you want to work in. So if you want to work in like conversation analysis, or you want to work yeah. in sociolinguistics, or you want to work in uh, grammar, then that's what you are really. And yes. you're going to use corpus methods to do it. And, um, and I think if you get that, then you can, it helps you see what, what, what you're doing and how to position yourself and like what the gap is you're trying to fill and how you can do that. Corporate. So I think those would be the two big ones. And finally, um, what will corpus research look like in 50 years? I just think all of linguistics will be corpus linguistics in 50 years. I don't think there'll be much left actually. Like I think increase, like there'll be, there'll be stuff being done in cognitive science using you know, and in psycholinguistics and stuff that uses um, that uses experiments and other types of methods to uh, get into the brain. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're not interested in being in the brain, if you're not interested in doing like mentalist linguistics, um, and even many people who are, will be working entirely with corpora. I'm not sure it'll be being done in linguistics. Like I think the resistance to corpora and linguistics, which is still there to some extent, at least among influential older members of the community will could, would be the death of linguistics moving forward. And maybe that will be happening in pure science or in natural language processing or data science. I mean, there's already a lot of that re research coming out, but I think most research, scientific research on uh, language will, especially on language structure use as opposed to language cognition um, mm. based on corpora. And, um, and I think the large, the rise of large language models is just the absolute evidence of just the value of corpus linguistics and how you can do corpus linguistics. And that's all you need to do to understand language structure. You don't need to elicit people. You don't need to get ev negative evidence. You can just look at what people do with language. Well, let's, uh, let's see what, what, what happens, uh, in, in the, the coming years, um, and, uh, the, the almost exponential, uh, growth of, uh, corpus linguistics. It's, it's yeah, it's going to take off like never before. It's going to just be dominant. Yeah. I mean, it, might, it might not even be called, it'll just be called like, you know, linguistics and lang language. Yes. Models, yeah. That's, yeah. That's will well, we will bring things to a close uh, at this point. Uh, thank you so much, Jack, for you, your time and for coming on. It's been a really interesting conversation and great to, to chat with you about you it. and your work. Um, and of course, thank you, our viewers and listeners, for joining us once again for this episode of Corpus Cast. Do let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes using the hashtag CorpusCast. Um, and you can uh, check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus, uh, and I am at Lovermob. CorpusCast is an Aston Originals podcast hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. So thanks again to you, our listeners, and thank you, Jack Grieve. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, and uh, hope to uh, see you all soon on the next episode of Corpus Cast. Thank you. Thank you.